Good afternoon. Joining me excitedly, I'd have to say, joining me is Seth Goldman, one of the rock stars of our industry, I'd say. Um, <laughs> I'm Cliff Feigenbaum, and I'm the founder and publisher of the Green Money Journal, and I'm taking the place of Tim Freundlich, who unfortunately fell ill last week and was unable to attend the conference. So uh, we'll do our best. Let me uh, start by introducing uh, a little bit of the background, uh, Tim's background. Seth. Tim, Seth, <laughs> background. As the co-founder and CEO of Honest Tea, he also is the executive chairman of Beyond Meat. Honest Tea is one of the most interesting companies I have come across in, through my time of publishing over the 27 years with Green Money Journal. Because it is now the nation's top selling bottled organic and fair trade tea. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, it was acquired by Coca-Cola for, you know, one reason was distribution of the reach that Coca-Cola has around the world, so we'll talk about that a little bit. But I thought one of the most interesting dynamics that showed the distribution was when I read about that Honest Tea and Honest Kids drinks are now distributed in 150,000 stores and restaurants around the world. That is an amazing growth. Then Seth's other job is with Beyond Meat, which is, of course, a company you've probably heard of. It is a fast-growing uh, company in the uh, plant-based protein arena. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's been a few years since you've been here. <laughs> Yeah, it's really, this is like a homecoming uh, because I, before I launched Honest Tea, I worked at Calvert. And so it's really fun to um, be back in this community and, and to see how we've each uh, evolved and gotten a little grayer. <laughs> yes, we <laughs> but, both have. Uh, but, but also to see how this movement has expanded as well, its reach and it, its, its impact. And uh, it's especially exciting because even though I know we've been toiling in the fields for a few decades now, I feel like we are just at the moment where we're breaking into a much broader scale of impact. So it's great to be here. So that journey is something I did want to talk about because I think I've known you the whole time. Yeah. I've, uh, days of Calvert yeah. and through Honesty and, and now with Beyond Meat. So it's, it's been very, uh, very interesting to follow your career and you know, have you write articles for us. And it's, uh, I think the people, need to hear a little bit, our audience, give us a little bit of the inside story of how you chose to leave Calvert and, and, yeah. and start this small organic yeah. tea company. Well, it was a funny conversation because I, I did love working at Calvert. It, it was a good company to work for. It was growing. I was involved. I was in charge of the marketing and the sales for the socially responsible portfolio. And so... Um, I enjoyed the work, I, I believed in the work, but I had an entrepreneurial itch and I was really just looking for what was the right idea that I could get excited about. And um, it hit me actually after I, I went uh, to New York City on behalf of Calvert to present to a bunch of ins institutional investors about socially responsible investing. And uh, after the presentation, I went for a run and after, uh, this was in, in New York, so I went to Central Park and after the run, I went to a just a cafe to try to buy a drink to quench my thirst. And I said, there's nothing in this cooler. And, and I was with a friend of mine. He said, well, what do you mean? There's dozens of hundreds of drinks. I said, they're all the same. They all have 100 calories. They're all high fructose corn syrup. Um, no one's making a drink that's less sweet. And I said, I don't know anything about the beverage industry, but I think I'm willing to give this a try. And I reached out to my professor from the Yale School of Management, Barry Nailbuff, and he became my co-founder. And when I had been a student, we talked about this idea and this opportunity. So I said, I'm ready to do something about this. And it was a, a funny conversation telling both Wayne Silvey and then Barbara Crumzik that I was 
leaving the investment world to go launch an iced tea company. Uh, but um, they were, you know, supportive, and I started, you know, Honesty out of my house a few months later with five thermoses and an empty Snapple bottle, and I brewed the tea in my kitchen and presented wow. it to a Whole Foods buyer and uh, sold him on the, on the concept, and, and he ordered 15,000 bottles, which was a little terrifying because we literally had never only made it in the kitchen. Um, but we, that's how we got started in, in Whole Foods, and we just grew from there. That's amazing. <laughs> How did, um, how did the relationship with Coca-Cola start? So we were growing in the natural channel and we became the best selling team in the natural foods industry and we were getting inquiries from mainstream channels. We were getting inquiries from you know, Target and Safeway. They wanted the product, um, but we didn't have the distribution to reach them. And so we got to this cross point, turning point as a company, which is, and I think this will be an, an analogy a lot of people in the audience will relate to is, you know, do we, do we stay pure and only focus on our core market, which would be the natural channel, or do we really think what we're doing is important and it needs to be scaled? And, and that's a theme we'll talk about a little bit later with Beyond Meat as well. And our point of view was it was never our goal just to sell healthy drinks to healthy people. Um, that if we really wanted to have impact, we needed to democratize this product. We needed to make it available wherever beverages are sold, not just in the coasts, not just in the, in the health food stores. And at the same time, Coca-Cola was going through their own transition point where they saw consumers evolving. They saw there was a whole group of um, retail outlets that they weren't reaching. And they looked and they did a search of over, um, they started with 3,000 brands, then they went to 300 brands, and then they went to 20, and then they went to one, which they thought represented the kind of future they wanted to invest in. And um, so they had just created a group called the Venturing and Emerging Brands Unit, uh, which reached out to us and said, we're interested. They initially said, we, uh, would you be interested in working with us? And I said, well, if working with you means an investment, yes. If it means selling to you, no, uh, because this is too early. It's too early in our development. So they came in as a minority investor for three years, and that was actually a, the right model. They'd never done that before. Their normal habit was just to buy it outright. But right. that was the right model, because we kept control of the brand, and we scaled the brand uh, with Coca-Cola. And you know, as, as you know, a lot of times when a when a company sells to an acquirer, the entrepreneur you know, goes, whatever they do, golfing, fishing, sailing, whatever. <laughs> I don't do any of those things. Um, and so Coke bought Honest Tea, Coke invested in Honest Tea in 2008, and here we are 11 years later and I'm still involved in the business because um, we have found, we both agree that it makes sense to have the entrepreneur still engaged in this enterprise. Well, I'd have to say that it was a controversial I think I said that right. Controversial decision at the time. Mm -hmm. I know that I thought, what is Seth doing? Coca-Cola, you know? Yeah. And I didn't really get it. And I, you know, so I said, would you write us an article about it? Right. And you did. And I read the article and I thought, I kind of get it, but I don't really get it. But what changed was I was somewhere in my travels at a conference somewhere and came across a Coke vending machine. And I look inside and there is an honest tea. Nice. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> there it is, sitting next to a Coca-Cola is an honesty, a true choice for consumers. And so I started looking around at every grocery store I'd go to or Everywhere I'd, I'd end up, I'd see if there's an honest tea option, and sure enough, there it is. Yeah. Any Coke machine, I'd make a little venture to go see in. And I was like, ah, that's it. That, yeah, that was it. really the goal. I mean, you know, to, to make these available um, wherever drinks can be sold, and also at an accessible price point. And one of the neatest things that happened um, just about two years ago was that Honest Kids, which is our organic kids drink, got picked up by McDonald's. And we went in at the exact same price point as the, the product they had previously. Um, the, the drink they had previously was 80 calories. Honest Kids is 35 calories. So um, you have a 45 calorie differential. We've sold over 200 million units, which means collectively, you know, Honest Tea, Coca-Cola, and McDonald's have removed about a billion empty calories from the American diet. And we start to get people, I think, yeah, that's an yeah. <laughs> and, and we start to um, it's introduce people to organics earlier. 
Um, and so, and then it, what's also been fun is we've launched Honesty now around the world. So I was just in Europe last month and to see the, um, the first fair trade product, fair trade certified product Coca-Cola has ever distributed in Europe uh, under our brand is, is, is gratifying. So um, it's, 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 you know, I'd say it's still a journey. We're still on it. But the reason that I um, continue to feel good about it is because the, the, the key parts of our brand, what's important about it, the less sweet, organic, and fair trade, those are all objective criteria. And the reason that's important is because if I just say it's healthy, it's natural, and it's socially conscious, that's somebody's interpretation. What I mean by that is I can't say this is organic unless we have a third party USDA you know, inspector. We can't say it's fair trade certified unless we have somebody inspecting the gardens, looking at the streams of cash to make sure we're paying, investing back in these communities. So if we imagine a world, you know, 10 years from now or whenever when I'm not connected to it, that criteria still is uh, my expectation helping to keep the brand honest. And that, that's important. Do you have a... Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a figure on organic acreage? Uh, that, that, you know, from when you started yeah, to where I can it give is? You one, I can give you a good statistic. So, so when Coke invested, before they invested, we were buying about 800,000 pounds of organic ingredients. Uh, this year we'll buy over 8.5 million pounds of organic ingredients. So, you know, clearly gaining that's about scale. 10 so, times, yeah. Yeah, more than 10 times. Uh, the other one that's exciting is that when Coke first invested, we were in contributing about $30,000 back to our fair trade supplier communities. This year, uh, we'll invest over $500,000 back into India, China, uh, South Africa, Paraguay, country and, and where, you know, in the developing world, that kind of money makes, is, is real. It makes an impact. Let's give them a hand for those. Uh, this is, <laughs> thank you. Well, I think, it, I think it's time that we shift gears. Let's do it. We're going to talk about Beyond Meat, but I think I'd like to introduce the company a little bit to you. Um, because in my research, uh, wanting to talk to, to Seth, I went online and saw the different products that you guys are offering now, but what really struck me was their mission statement, because I thought it spoke loudly, it spoke truthfully, and I'll look forward to, to uh, hearing your comments, Seth, but I thought I'd read it. At Beyond Meat, we believe there is a better way to feed the planet. Our mission is to create the future of protein, delicious plant-based burgers, beef, sausage, crumbles, and more. By shifting from animal to plant-based meats, we can address four growing global issues. Human health, climate change, constraints on natural resources, and animal welfare. <laughs> Thank you. So, tell us, how did you approach Beyond Meat, or this did they a, approach you? This is a fun you? story, I'll, I'll okay. share with you. And um, so, in 2012, you know, we sold Honesty to Coca-Cola 2011, and. Uh, in 2012, it started to become apparent that my role was going to shift. I still absolutely in need for me to be there and help guide the brand, but I wasn't going to be the, the TEO. I call myself the TEO the way I had been for the first 10 years. So I thought, okay, I let, I'm, I'm eager to scale this, this business, Honest T, but I got to find another challenge. Uh, where can I, what's, enough, what's the next thing for me to get involved in? And I literally was, you know, just thinking around what, what it might be. And on my wife's 50th birthday, she read an article about this company getting started on the West Coast uh, called Beyond Meat that was seeking to replicate the taste and texture of meat using plants. And at the time, my wife said, if this company succeeded, it would be the best birthday present ever <laughs> because our family has been vegetarian now for 14 years. Uh, we became vegetarian. My, my, I have three sons. My, my oldest son, when he was 10 years old, we took him to an animal sanctuary. And, uh, and just had a wonderful time, and he really got friendly with this chicken named George, and they just, it was just very sweet. But then we went home that night, and we had chicken for dinner. <laughs> and he said, what's the difference between George and what's on this plate? And I said, well, it's not that much different. 
He said, well, if we can meet our dietary needs without killing animals, why wouldn't we try to do that? And I, I didn't have a good answer, but I didn't become vegetarian. He did. And uh, over the next two years, he convinced his two younger brothers, sometimes by force, to become vegetarians as well. Uh, and it was on the occasion of his 13th birthday, it was his bar mitzvah, and uh, he gave a, a, an interpretation of the Torah, um, which helped persuade me to become vegetarian and my wife. And so we were always happy with the decision from an ethical perspective, but in 2012, we were dissatisfied with the decision from a culinary perspective, in the sense that we were just disappointed with a lot of the offerings. I, I, I've joked before that veggie burgers were a conspiracy by the meat industry to discourage people from becoming vegetarian because you taste it once and you say, I just don't need to be a vegetarian that badly. So when we read this article about Beyond Meat, I said, this, this sounds interesting. And I literally sent an email to info at beyondmeat.com and said, I read this article. You know, I've learned a thing or two about scaling a food business, a mission-driven food business. If there's any way I can help, I'd love to help. And at the time, the company was doing less than a million in sales. There was a lot of need for help. So I managed to meet them and um, became an uh, investor and then a board member and an advisor and um, really enjoyed the work. I, I, I thought it would be hard. I, don't, I, I thought I would never be as passionate about any enterprises as I've been about honesty because it does check so many boxes. Right, right. But um, when I really started to get engaged with Beyond Meat and address those issues you mentioned, I realized I, I could be just as passionate about this. And so I got into a regular cycle where I would talk to the founders every Friday and we'd just have a consultation. And then it was productive enough that we made it every other day. And so then as my role shifted more with honesty, I, I very thankful that the Coca-Cola company allowed me to basically split my time, half my time with honesty and the other half with Beyond Meat as, as, as executive chairman. Great story. Um, you've been with the company about six years yeah. now. Yeah. And last year you had an IPO. This year, this year, May of May, May, May second. Yeah. It's that. <laughs> Boy, it feels I've like been it's too been busy. Five years, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've been putting two years in. Um, tell us about that IPO yeah. process. So, um, just to give you a sense of scale and difference, Honest Tea over its first ten years, we raised about ten million dollars, really from angel investors, and that was enough to grow the business. Beyond Meat raised over $100 million, mostly from you know, venture and, and, and other investors. And so it was much more capital intensive. Uh, but, and, and to be fair, you know, the, on a good day, the iced tea category is about a $3 billion category. Um, the um, meat category in the United States is over $200 billion. It's a $1.4 trillion category worldwide. So a much bigger prize and obviously one that needs more in investment to, 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 win, to catch that prize. And so we started to look at how we were growing and we started to look at the, the scale of the opportunity. And just to, just to sort of put it out there, this is, um, it's the largest category in food. It's the only category that hasn't seen innovation for decades, right? I mean, the cow hasn't evolved. The only, the only, the only innovations we've seen in meat have been around um, you know, GMOs, hormones, antibiotics, gestation crates, all the kind of things the consumer has Pushed, you know, rebelled against. It's the only category in food, one of the only categories in food where there's no branding. So you get the largest category with no innovation, no differentiation, and very little branding. And we realized we could grab a significant share, but it's going to take real resources. You can't do this on a dime. I mean, the, the reason those veggie burgers were so bad is because all these other companies were just mushing stuff together and saying that's supposed to be a substitute from meat that comes from a hamburger. And what we did at Beyond Meat was fundamentally different. We said, let's understand from, from a, a literally the cell structure, let's, let's do an MRI of a hamburger. Let's understand how, what, a, what meat is. Let's understand it better than anybody. And so it really is, um, it's an assembly of uh, amino acids that make the proteins, lipids that form the fats. It's 70% water. And then it's minerals, trace minerals and carbohydrates, all of which come from plants. You know, by definition, they come from plants. All meat comes from plants, right. but right. What, if we, what if we leave the animal out of the equation? What if we can use uh, heat and pressure and cooling and reconstruct uh, meat from plants? And so that's not a cheap date. That's, <laughs> that's not an inexpensive proposition. So we did need access to capital. Um, but so then we said, well, how do we access the capital? And we had raised money, as I said, privately 
Uh, and as we looked at the scale of growing this globally, we, we wanted access to capital, but um, we had already been raising a lot of money. And it's interesting, I, the Honest Tea transaction with Coca-Cola happened within a week of our 10th anniversary, and Beyond Meat's IPO happened within weeks of that company's 10th anniversary. So 10 years is a long time to hold someone's money. And it just felt like, all right, this is the next step for us to access capital, to make sure we have the resources to grow. Uh, and, and, you know, frankly, this is, and I, I hope this audience will appreciate this. We, can, we all know there's a lot of criticism about capitalism these days and that it's out of whack. But the, the IPO experience, you know, and, and through today, for me, really reinforced um, the power of this system. I was going to say magic. I don't think it's magic, but the power and potential of the system to, to um, take an idea from just a, fun, a bunch of people in a room to scale, to help change people's diets, to help change our impact on the environment. So this really, for me, was a very um, rein positively reinforcing moment that capitalism can do amazing things and there's no other system that enables that uh, to happen the way, the way it has happened. Can you give us some ideas on your strategy going forward with sure. Beyond Me and what you're, what you're looking to yeah. do next? Here's a good way to think about what we're doing at Beyond Meat. So think about the dairy category. Um, the, the, you know, 20 years ago, dairy was milk, cow's milk. That's all it was. And the only innovation was maybe skim milk and maybe the 1%, 2%, you know. Um, but if you look at the dairy cooler today, 13% of it is plant-based, soy milk, and almond milk, oat milk, and the, the plant-based dairy um, occupies the shelf adjacent to cow milk. Um, we believe that same opportunity is available in the meat category. Um, it's not, it hasn't been capitalized on because the products haven't been good enough. But Beyond Meat was the first product, plant-based meat product to be merchandised adjacent to animal meat. And so we think about it, that 13% of the meat category being a, a, a prize that we can grab. And then we've seen amazing response. So, and just to share with you how exciting this moment is, because we've all, you know, we've been on this planet for a while. Within our lifetimes, we are redefining what meat is. By the time, well, I guess I'll say my grandchildren grow up, um, they will find it hard to believe that animal meat was the staple of our diets. They'll, they won't understand that animal, plant-based protein wasn't the main product we eat. Um, and that's just happening during our lifetimes. I mean, just in the past month, uh, well, just last week, we, um, Beyond Meat launched nationally with Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, as the, I the, saw the, a commercial the, yeah, last yeah, night yeah, for the... Yeah. Uh, Snoop Dogg. I was like, well, <laughs> I'm working on this, and it, here comes the commercial for yeah. it, I thought. So this, so is, this is happening incredibly quickly. Just in the past quarter, Beyond Meat launched trials with McDonald's, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and Subway. Uh, I mean... Having been in the food business, that doesn't happen in a, all at once in a quarter. There's something fundamentally being rewired about our food system in, in a good way. Um, and, and just to go back to what my dairy analogy, two other data points. The first is that Dean Foods declared bankruptcy, as you know. Uh, the second data point, that was just this week. The second data point is that Whole Foods, if you, I just looked at their most recent data of plant-based dairy, 51% of Whole Foods dairy cases now plant-based. So with Whole Foods always being a leading indicator, I think that 13%, it's absolutely the target we're gonna shoot for initially, but this change is happening in a very pervasive way, and I'm confident uh, that meat will follow the same track. Well, there has been so much innovation in the food business yeah. over the, the coming. I know that I've changed my diet tremendously, and one of the things that I, discovered in changing my diet was I don't like eating soy. Yeah. So uh, all my protein drinks are pea-based yeah. protein. And so I was really glad to find out that, you know, Beyond Meat is pea protein based. Right. And your competitor it uses soy. So it was an easy choice. Thank you. Um, Although for, just to be clear, two things. One, you know, our competitor is the meat industry. There is another company that uses soy, but we think about the competition as the meat industry. But for us, it, was, it did make sense to avoid soy, um, partially because the consumer has a lot of negative perceptions, partially because so much soy is GMO and our product is non-GMO. But um, as we scale this globally, and, and we are scaling quickly globally, you know, in a country like China, we're not afraid to use soy. There's obviously 
that's an ingredient that's widely accepted. And, and, and our, although we okay. use peas now, the approach really is to be plant agnostic. We'll use plants always. We're not, we're not going to use the animal, but we can. We not can. A term um, I've heard before. Yeah, we can source. We can source. Um, in, what we'll always want to do is source the, a local crop grown in a country of origin and of where there's you know so many uh, protein-based plants and be able to make it you know that crop available. And, and of course, as we think about trying to feed the world, seven billion, let alone ten billion people, there's just not enough earths around. To, 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 for everyone to have the kind of um, livestock-based diet that we have in the United States. And so we, it's, it's a matter of survival. We have to shift to plant-based. And this actually, because uh, the Beyond Burger uses 99% less water and 93% less land compared to a beef burger, it's conceivable that a, you know, a country like Bangladesh could feed its population with just, you know, a, 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 and let them meet the full nutritional needs, but to do it without a livestock industry. Wow. Yeah. This is... Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I thought I'd ask you a little bit about, along your journey, um, people, books, who've inspired you yeah. and your you know, business career, and, and can you tell us? Sure. Well, you know, uh, the person who got me into this whole thing in the beginning was Wayne Silby, founder of Calvert. Um, we, uh, he found me when I was at Yale School of Management, and, and uh, I loved his vision of, you know, really redefining and in, helping to re reshape an industry. And, and so I, I joined Calvert, and so he was a great mentor. Gary Hirschberg, the um, CEO of uh, Stonyfield Farm, was one of, my, one of my first board members and still a close friend, and helped me learn about how to um, take a healthy product and make it mainstream. Oh, another wonderful mentor has been Jeff Swartz, the uh, CEO of Timberland, the footwear and apparel company. He was on my board, and um, he had a, this great quote. We were walking down the street one day, and we saw someone wearing a Timberland shirt. He said, look at that. This person takes my brand and puts it on their body. He says, what could be more intimate than that? And I realized what could be more intimate is somebody who takes my brand and puts it in their body. <laughs> That's pretty intimate. And just thinking about how important it is to build a brand and always, always, always make sure you do the right thing by the brand. You, you just can't, um, you can't make the, the short-term decision. So thinking that way. And then I'd love to share, you know, my, one of my great mentors has is, is been my son, the one who got me to be a vegetarian. Um, I've learned so much from him. I still learn from him. He's just launched a, a, a beautiful restaurant uh, in Silver Spring. It's a plant-based restaurant. And he came up with this great phrase, which I am totally embracing. So he took the Gandhi phrase, be the change you wish to see in the world, and rephrased it to eat the change you wish to see in the world. And as we think about climate change and we think about behavior, we have to create this imperative. Everyone feels, uh, not everyone, so many, <laughs> but if you don't feel frustrated about the world is, with the way the world is going, you're not paying attention. So everyone should feel frustrated <laughs> and everybody should feel they have a role to play because the single biggest impact any of us make on climate on a daily basis is what we put at the center of our plate. And so if you, <laughs> if you want to take, if you want to own responsibility for it, eat the change. And so this is just a beautiful phrase that I've, um, I think has a ton of potential, and, and, uh, and I, I really do believe you can learn from everybody, so, I'm, uh, and, uh, um, so those are some of my, my mentors. Any books that you would recommend that? You know, I, I, um, I read a lot of different books. The uh, most recent one that I enjoyed was, was uh, Phil Knight's book, uh, Shoe Dog, just, just a fun entrepreneurial story. Um, but the one that always speaks to me is um, Jack London's Call of the Wild. And the reason I like that is because it speaks to the fact that we are, even though we can dress fancy and sit in the room, we are all animals. We are all, um, you know, uh, obviously not wild beings, but we all have instincts. And so often people are uh, raised to ignore their instincts. And I think uh, for me, whenever I can, I try to listen to my instincts. And I do think the things that have gotten me through have been that there's been plenty of moments where there's been pressure, you know, to, to go along, to even, you know, as we're part of Coca-Cola, to sort of um, just make the decision that the corporate parent wants you to make. And it was only because I could listen to my instincts enough um, that, you know, I think the, the brand still is thriving and I'm, I still feel good about 
what I'm doing. Well, I think we'll close with one more question. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and that is that tonight, for the first time, the conference is giving out a 30 under 30 award. Yeah to really acknowledge some of the younger people in our industry. And I was wondering if you would give them, who are in attendance, maybe all of us, <laughs> a piece of career advice. Yeah. So it's interesting, when you go through, um, when you're in college and then in business, if you go to business school, there's always that tension. Do you go for the work that gives you, you know, the credentials, or do you go for uh, something you believe in, you know? Um, so people say, oh, I'm going to go work for P&G, and then I'm going to go work for, you know, some mission company. And I'm a believer in more ways than one. I'm a believer in the pure play. So one of the things I love about what we're doing at Beyond Meat is um, there's not compromise to this business. And, and it was really interesting during the... Um, so having basically sort of grown up in this SRI industry, once we did our road show and I started talking to ESG investors, I realized that a lot of them really are just trying to do less harm. You try to, you invest, if, you, if you're investing in food companies, publicly traded food companies, there just aren't pure plays out there. You're investing in every diversified food company, and every, every food company is diversified, and as a result, you know, they may have a plant-based division or offering, but that's adjacent, within inside a much larger footprint that's not, a, doesn't feel as good. So, um, from a career perspective, I think there's no downside to always doing what you believe in. Don't, don't sort of say, I'm going to sort of take a values neutral job so I can gain some skills and then I'll get to do what I really believe in at some point. Like, life's too short to ever do something you don't believe in. And so my, my, adv <laughs> my advice is start with something you believe in and, and you gain so much power from being authentic. You can always be your, your true self. You never have to you know, sort of play a corporate game. Um, and, and that can be scary to do sometimes because it, 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 sometimes it means more risk. I, I, you know, in business school, I, all my classmates had, you know, got their recruiting jobs back in December and I was there in April still negotiating with Calvert to figure out if we had a job for me. And, and uh, you know, obviously it worked out, but um, if you've got to... So I think the pure play in life and work and in business is the best recipe. I think we'll end there. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Really nice to be here. Thank you, All right. Thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs>